Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. Today I'm going to bring you some actual history from this book right here, Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wilbarger, published back in 1889. Now today's story takes place around Comanche County, uh, but it also occurs in nearby counties such as Erath, Brown, and Hamilton counties. It's called The Attack on Baggett's House. During the first week in March of 1857, a large band of marauding Indians came down, and on approaching the frontier, divided into squads of eight and ten simultaneously, and they entered Arath, Brown, and Comanche counties, and began depredating in the most daring and alarming manner. A severe drought the previous year had caused an entire failure in crop in 1856, which was followed by a severely cold winter, which had reduced what few cow ponies the settlers had left to so thin in flesh that very few were able to do any kind of service. In fact, most of the citizens were literally afoot. Breadstuffs had to be bought and freighted in on ox wagons from Fannin, Grayson, Collin, and Dallas counties. While in this helpless condition, three different squads of Indians began depredations at the same time in different parts of Comanche County. One squad of ten passed down the south of Leon Valley in open day gathering what few horses they could find and four miles below Old Cora, now extinct, on the third day of March, 1857, about four o'clock p.m., they came upon Gid Foreman and killed him, taking off every vestige of his hair with his scalp. Foreman had red hair, which is a great trophy among Comanche Indians. They stripped Foreman, save for his drawers, and mutilated his body in a most horrible manner. After butchering this unfortunate man and tying his reeking bloody scalp to one of their belts, they proceeded down the valley and crossed North Leon, and about 5 o'clock p.m. they approached John Baggett's ranch, near the present town of Hazel Dell, driving up into the yard and catching the only horse Baggett had left. At the time, Mr. Baggett was not at home, and he had no neighbors nearer than four miles away. Now come, ye sentimental lovers of heaven's noblest gift to man, a wife and mother, and view with me this terrible, tragic scene. No ignis fatus, no fiction or imaginary concoction of the brain, but a reality. A lone woman with nine helpless children, with no chance of escape, and no means of protection, not even a gun, Mr. Baggett had that with him, and surrounded by ten steel-hearted fiendish Indians, in whose veins the milk of human sin sympathy had never flowed, with hideous visages made doubly frightful by being debaubed all over with war paint, and uttering fiercely their diabolical war whoops, their dark bodies besmeared, and their hands still dripping with the lifeblood of foreman, whose gory scalp was still dripping the crimson fluid and hanging to a fiendish Indian, whose greatest delight was in torturing his most innocent victim, while the excruciating suffering and agonizing cries only served to increase his merriment. Mrs. Baggett succeeded in getting seven of the children into the cabin while the Indians were catching the horse. But alas, O oh horror of horrors, two of the children, little Joel, who was aged twelve, and little Betty, ten years old, were under a live oak tree playing some sixty yards from the cabin, and they were intercepted, caught, and four of the Indians proceeded slowly so as to prolong the sufferings of little Joel, and to increase and intensify a mother's agony in torturing the little fellow by landing Dancing him with arrows in every conceivable way to produce the most acute and excruciating suffering, and if possible, to add additional pain and to make his lifeless form appear the more ghastly and horrible, while his plaintive, piteous shrieks and cries were still audible to a mother's ears. One of the Indians, to whose belt was hanging poor Gid Foreman's gory scalp, proceeded before life was extinct in little Joel to scalp him and hung the scalp on the opposite side of his belt, as an additional trophy to heighten the pleasure of their fiendish war dances. But is this all of this frightful tragedy? No. Not content with torturing, scalping, and killing little Joel, but if possible to add to a mother's already overflowing cup of sorrow and grief, 
mentally equal to a Spanish Inquisition, those barbaric and unfeeling Indians proceeded to lance little Betty in twenty places, in three places to the hollow, then turning her loose to go bleeding, staggering, and fainting twice before she reached the house. On reaching the house, Mrs. Baggett still had the presence of mind to say, Betty, go around to the other door. The Indians will kill all of us if Mama opens this door. Four of the Indians had followed the child to within twenty paces of the door, thinking no doubt that Mrs. Baggett would be imprudent enough to come out and meet the child, but she well knew her own life and that of her other seven children depended upon her remaining in the house. So, failing this, the Indians remounted and rode off just before dark, and as soon as they left, Mrs. Baggett carried in the lifeless and mangled body of her boy, and had washed and dressed him before their father's return, one hour after dark. To attempt to describe the feelings of Mrs. Baggett on this occasion would be an utter failure and a mockery of the sublimest fortitude and courage known alone to mothers. Indeed, no language except it be that of angels is capable of describing such a scene or a mother's love. Little Betty got well, grew to womanhood, she married, and now she is the wife of a wealthy and respected gentleman living at Abilene, Texas. Mr. and Mrs. Baggett are both dead. On the next night, after the killing of Foreman and the tragedy at Baggett's house, another squad of Indians that had been depredating in the upper part of the county were coming into the town of Comanche, but when within about 1,200 yards from the public square, they were met by a scout that had been raised to guard the town. Though they knew that the Indians were in the county, and had started out expressly to look for them, yet they were completely surprised, not expecting to meet Indians coming into town. But the unexpected meeting to both parties resulted in a fight at once, in which Kenneth Mackenzie received a fatal wound, from which he died in a few hours, and James Mackenzie received a severe wound from which he has never entirely recovered, but will always be an invalid. Some of the boys in this fight had never before been in an Indian fight, and were a little fuller of whiskey, perhaps, than courage, just at that particular moment, and while some of them were shooting at the Indians, others were shooting back into town in double-quick time, carrying each one a whole scalp on top of his own head, but minus two horses, killed by shots either from the Indians or by their own party. The Indians held the ground and left at their leisure, but without carrying away any trophies of victory. To use the language of one of the men who participated in this skirmish, and who gave us these facts, too much whiskey and Indian fighting don't mix worth a cent. So that's the end of uh, this unfortunate story. So uh, I guess it wasn't as bad as it could have been, uh, but it was still a pretty terrible tragedy. Uh, these deaths that resulted from this invasion into Comanche and nearby counties back in 1857. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.